the world is going through a fundamental transition. We're seeing a completely new breed of organization being built. Every institution and mechanism that we use to run the world, it doesn't work. We shift the world more and more towards abundance because we actually have abundance of food and energy. It's a distribution problem. Pick your MTP. What is the what is the core thing that you wake up every six, at 6 a.m. every morning to try and solve? This is the mentality, I think, that is so important and so needed in this next generation. Yeah. Hey guys, this is Catalin and welcome to uh, today's interview. I have Salim Ismail with me. Salim, so thanks so much for taking the time and being with us. We're here in Toronto, your um, hometown actually, right? Hometown uh, and recently just moved back. Yes, because of your son, right? So Salim, for those people that don't know, uh, is, uh, uh, is an extraordinary entrepreneur. He founded multiple technology companies, one of them being sold to Google. Um, and um, uh, you're very passionate about business, entrepreneurship, Exponential Technology, you're the author of, uh, um, of, um, of a best-selling book that we're going to talk about, Exponential Organizations, and obviously Singularity University. So a lot of different things, and um, I think this will be a very interesting conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time. Great to be here. So, so let me start with this. Um, let's give people a little bit of a context of, uh, actually, you, so you've done so many things in your life, and you've ended up here today doing a lot of the things that you're doing at Singularity University and helping companies plan and create the, the companies of tomorrow with all the things that are going on in technology and all these emerging things. How did you end up here? Like, what's your, what's oh, your story? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, total chaos. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm from India originally. At, the, at age 10, my parents emigrated to Canada. Um, my father hated noise, dirt, pollution, and corruption. So mm. India's not so great for that. Uh, so we moved to Canada. I did my schooling and university here. I, by accident and mostly by luck, got into Waterloo, which is the big technical university, and so my degrees in from there. And then I went to Europe for 10 years um, and built computing systems for a few years and then um, uh, got into management consulting. And so I've had a very diverse, uh, it turns out I've now lived exactly a quarter of my life in India, uh, Canada, Europe, and the US. Mm. So I'm pretty uh, confused uh, mm. overall. Uh, but it means that I'm I'm not tied or attached to any one paradigm, just by definition. Um, I, I think that we worked out last year that I've now lived in more than eight, eight countries for more than a year each. Wow. Um, and so uh, you get a different perspective when you live in France for a year versus, say, um, um, Canada versus uh, India and other places. And so there's this incredible, weird breadth of experience and diversity by default. Um, I come from a diplomatic family in India, so even that's kind of detached from normal day-to-day -day type of life. Uh, and then I got to the New York in uh, 99 and built out my first uh, tech company. Um, and what I've noticed is every five years, uh, the universe plucks me out and puts me somewhere else. Mm. Uh, and initially, it's very upsetting because you're like just getting into something or whatever. And then you get used to it. And then you embrace it. And now I look forward to it. Mm. Uh, and so. If you can kind of deal with that uh, change, then you're able to cope with almost any situation. Uh, so that's kind of a quick summary of it. Right. So uh, it's very interesting that you, you landed in, in New York right before the dot-com boom and like the whole thing blew up. So going through all the things you went through and building these companies and being involved in so many projects, what would you say is your perspective of the world now? And in the future, like how do you see the world right now? What are some major things that you, th you like th when you think of the world? It'll be like these are the things that I see, and people seem to not see the same things. Yeah, so it's very clear to me that the world is going through a fundamental transition in how we live our lives and what's happening on the planet uh, in a way that we've never seen before for a thousand years, and certainly not in our lifetimes. Mm. Uh, and we're moving uh, more and more domains from scarcity to abundance, mm. which is one of the characteristics of technology. Maybe the most profound being solar energy, mm. um, which is one, on one of these doubling patterns that we try to teach at Singularity University. Um, we will hit 100% of world energy supply that can be delivered by solar in literally 13 years. Wow. Uh, and so energy, which has been scarce for the entire history of humanity, now becomes abundant. And when you have free energy, then you can desalinate water easily when you have clean water, it means you can, um, uh, it means you take out half the disease burden in the world, right? So the, the kind of the effects of what's going to happen in this next 10, 20, 30 years is unbelievably profound, incredibly positive. But our human systems and the ability of us as a society to absorb this is very limited. 
And this is the stress that we see in the world, and, and we're very, very concerned about that. Yeah. So let's talk about that, because uh, I'm, we talked about this before we started the interview, about this idea of all the companies being built for an environment of scarcity, and now the world moving into a, a mindset and an environment of abundance. And like, how, so what do you mean by that? Please, uh, yeah, so, so technology is a fundamental driver of taking something from scarcity to abundance. Yes. In film photography, you're kind of operating on a material substrate and you're kind of very carefully clicking here and there because it's a dollar a photograph. You move to digital photography, marginal costs go to zero, and now we take a billion photographs, mm -hmm. right? And you've gone from scarcity to abundance. And the business model changes. In a, in a scarcity model, I may sell very expensive cameras, I may offer courses on photography, et cetera, but in an abundance problem, um, I have eight copies of uh, photographs on 10 devices and I can't find anything, mm. right? And, and now the money is, where can I find socialized, surface the great stuff? We now need AI to look through our photographs and pick out cool things, et cetera. And so it totally, and the money leaves the system because in an abundance model, you don't need as much uh, money to run it. And especially as we move to an information-based paradigm. Mm. Right? So uh, we're finding this in very subtle ways in, throughout our lives. You know, there's a, fa there's a famous picture of the uh, big desk of equipment that all gets replaced by apps. Right. right? And now essentially uh, everything is being digitized to that extent. Uh, we're now digitizing emotion. Right? And so little by little we're moving. I'll give you a little story that, that really brings it home. It's very subtle and very pervasive, this, this uh, dematerialization and demonetization that's going on. Um, uh, we have a house here in Toronto that we bought. And the backyard is quite dark. And so my wife said, I want to have lights in, the, lights in the backyard. So I'm like, mm. okay. And so we get a quote from the electricians, and it's going to cost $2,500 to put up a light, run the wiring and the thing, have a timer, have a sensor, et cetera. And I'm like, $2,500 for a light? That seems like a little absurd. Um, and surely, you know, maybe there's a better way. I do five minutes of searches on Amazon, mm. and I find a solar-powered uh, sensor-driven light with a battery in it that... Uh, cost $9.99. And did the same job. Right? And did the same job. And it's motion detected, so you come close, the light lights up. Solar energy, you don't need to run any wires, right? So I bought four of them because they're $9.99 <laughs> each. So instead of $2,500 being spent, I spent about $40, and now the backyard is perfectly lit up. And so there's an example of, now I can use that money elsewhere. Leisure activities, gaming, etc. So little by little, we're, we're moving to an abundance of time. We're moving to an abundance of uh, space, we can time slice ourselves very well. And so little by little, we shift the world more and more towards abundance. And it's hard to see, but that's happening. Uh, energy may be the most profound example, but the fact that I can use my phone anywhere allows me to be productive anywhere, right? So now instead of four or five hours a day of productive work in an office, I'm productive about 18 hours a day. Yeah. And now with the difficulties, how the hell do you find time to rest? Yeah. Right? But essentially, we're kind of taking that paradigm through the entire planet. Uh, and the business model changes when you do this. And so, you know, we've run the world on the model of scarcity for thousands of years. In fact, in, in, for the last few thousand years, if you didn't have scarcity, you didn't have a business. Mm. Right? But now we're seeing new business models, and this is where exponential organizations tap into. Uber is tapping into an abundance of cars lying around. Airbnb is tapping into an abundance of extra bedrooms lying around. And information enabling them, and then bringing them into the broader economy and taking those underutilized assets and actually using them for their full capacity. Exactly. Mm. Because we actually have abundance of food and energy. It's a distribution problem more than anything else. Right. So, so there, there's, there's all these things that are having exponential curves in, in cost reduction, all these things like solar energy you're, you're talking about, which is like obviously an infrastructure thing. If that happens, all these other, all other, a lot of other things will get a lot better exponentially. The problem I feel in my gut with all these things is I hear you talking about them and I hear the Amanda's talk about them. It's like, it's, um, and I see this in a lot of people, they hear them like, okay, this is, the cost of this is going from $1 to $0.05. Cents. And it's like, oh yeah, okay. No, that's, that's a huge difference. Yeah, that's massive. Difference. So what do you think in terms of people's ability to understand and really comprehend in their gut these exponential curves? How can we make people like really understand the speed yeah. at which things are moving because we're not made to understand $400 billion improvement. Or no, we can't cope with it. In fact, yeah. cognitively, so how do you deal with that? In fact, almost all of the training, and this is why we set up Singularity University. Yeah. Ray identified that we now have a dozen technologies operating on this pace, right? Yeah. And this is totally unique. 
in the history of mankind, we had maybe at any given point one technology accelerating or another, but now we have a dozen. Yeah. Right. Uh, drones, 3D printing, neuro in, in neuroscience, the resolution at which we can image the brain is doubling every year. Right. right. Same with drones, doubling every nine months, gene sequencing every five months. This is unreal. We've never seen this before. Yeah. And so each one, but when, where they intersect, you add a whole other multiplier to the equation. Yeah. Right. So the LIDAR unit that you, the Google cars use to drive, uh, light radar, uh, six years ago cost $75,000 and now costs $40. Mm. Right? And you can't get your head around that. If you're in the car industry, you think, okay, that's $75,000. You cannot imagine, conceive, or kind of grok the fact that it costs almost nothing six years later. And so because all of our education, training, intuition about the world linear. is linear. Right? So we learn something intuitively. It registers physically in our bodies in a very visceral way. Um, if you went back 100 years ago, anything important in your life happened within a day's walk. Right? Now something that happens in Tokyo affects us in a second, and we cognitively, biologically, evolutionarily are not designed for this. And, so, uh, and there's two levels of this. One is at the individual, and the other is at the group level. Mm. Right? Individuals we can kind of handle. At the worst case, you have generational change, yeah. and you have uh, the younger generation growing up. And think about this. If you went back 1,000 years ago, the lives that one generation led were exactly the same as their kids and their grandkids and their great kids. And so you could pass wisdom down the generations. You could say, hey, process. when you hear not that noise, run, those berries, don't eat them uh, until it's summer, et cetera, et cetera. And one generation could teach the next. Think about any of us and how different our lives are from our parents. Right? Really, really different. And that next generation is even more different. I think of any kids below 12 years old as a different species. I mean, forget them even being human. This you is like have a, whole, a son, you know what he's I have, a, I have a seven-year-old son, and he is not human, right? This is not a normal kid. Um, and so, so, and they're all like that. They're all kind of, mm. all, so you cannot teach them. The worst thing you could do is say, you know, I grew up this way, and therefore you should grow up that way. Yeah. So at individual level, we can kind of navigate it. And we also have decent tools at the individual level, like uh, uh, neuro-linguistic programming and uh, biofeedback mechanisms, and now neurofeedback mechanisms, and... Uh, microdosing of drugs, et cetera, to alter the individual. Hmm. Tony Robbins, Landmark Education, a whole bunch of others have figured out how do you manage state changes and navigate yourself. The real challenge that I see where we don't have enough tools is at the organizational and institutional level. Right. right? Uh, uh, you try and update the Catholic Church, like Pope Francis was trying to do, and you see the unbelievable stress that's happening there. Or you try and update uh, an old organization. You take a hundred year old company like a Procter & Gamble or Coca-Cola, and then you say, hey, let's do something radically different, and you get what I call this immune system response, and you spend all your time fighting the antibodies in that environment. Or at the institutional level, uh, with this pace of change and this forcing function of technology, every institution and mechanism that we use to run the world, it doesn't work. Mm. Our legal systems are breaking down, our healthcare systems don't work, our intellectual property, forget about it, right? Um, legal systems, monetary systems, civics, governance models, political models, every single one of them is breaking down, journalism, et cetera. And the real challenge that I see right now is that we're breaking these things down and there's nothing to replace them. We don't know what they should look like and we don't, aren't able to conceive what life should be like and that feedback loop to incorporate new changes is not there. Mm. And so we're gonna hit a wall. And if you, look at, if you look at civilizations in the past, the Romans and the Incas and the Mayans and whatever, they all got to an incredible level of complexity. And then they weren't able to make that final transition, and then boom, they all collapsed. Right? And essentially, that's what I think is happening today. Our civilization is hitting, hitting a point where the old models simply don't work, and we don't have the tool sets to navigate to the new models. Do you think that's, um, I mean, in biology, this is called evolutionary mismatch. When you have an environment, yeah. you develop a certain behavior, then the environment changes. You don't change your behavior, and then you have three options. Either the environment goes back, which rarely does. Either you evolve, or you decline or go extinct. Yeah. So what do you, what do you think is like the same? We totally, we, we've, yeah. it, this is like the dinosaurs and the comet has hit. Yeah. Except the comet is information. Yeah, and we right? don't really know it. And we don't really understand it. And yeah. so... We can understand the visceral world. Mm. We, we've kind of uh, evolutionary four billion years of, of living on the planet has given us a good sense of the visceral, physical reality of the world. But you have no sense of the, the digital environment, right? Yeah. And we can't kind of deal with that. We can deal with bullying in school, right? We can kind of understand that. Cyberbullying, but what the hell is that? How does that, why does that affect us? And yet it does. 
And yet, and yet, how do you relate to that? And so we have enormous difficulty navigating this next step. Mm. And so what I'm working on now is two things. I think those, the technologies are there to help us, but we need the tool sets to manage that transition. Mm. And so that's almost all the work I do now since the book came out. Yeah, so what is, okay, so it seems like this is the environment we're in right now, and it's, it, there's a mismatch, a big mismatch uh, uh, <laughs> In, in the whole world at this, and a lot of people don't see it, yeah. and they don't see it because now it works. It's just in a decline, yeah. right? So it's not a big pain right now. You're not fat. You don't need to go to the gym right now, but you're getting worse. Yes. So what, what is the solution? What's this exponential organization? And just briefly, because a lot of people get the book, and they will sure. do this. So what, what do you think is the solution for... So from a business perspective, right? Yeah. Um, as we have, we're finding for the first time business models around abundance, as mm. we talked about. Mm. Um, and these new businesses, what we noticed was over the six, last six, eight years, we're seeing a completely new breed of organization being built that we've never seen before. Uh, and there's lots of characteristics like leveraging community, uh, like Ted does, or uh, leveraging other people's assets like Airbnb or hiring staff on demand rather than having a workforce like Uber. But yeah. the core economic thesis uh, is as follows. If you're running a business, you worry about uh, demand and supply, right? And very specifically, what's the cost of demand and what's the cost of supply? And hopefully you're on the right side of that equation. Hmm. The, and all, businesses forever have been optimized around, okay, I have products and services and let me work out the optimized cost of demand and cost of supply. Then the hmm. internet came along and allowed us to drop the cost of demand generation exponentially, Zero. right? Online marketing, referral marketing, the viral loop. Every Silicon Valley company is aiming for the holy grail of a viral loop. And then your customer acquisition costs go to zero. Okay? And this is never before in history could you acquire customers at no cost. This is pretty amazing. Um, and so that paradigm has been running for 10 years. And we see uh, huge uh, Googles and Facebooks and Yahoos coming out because they can acquire customers at no cost and they get the revenue. And so that's amazing. What's really even more magical, though, with these exponential organizations is there's one thing that have a cost of uh, demand go down, but they figured out how to drop the cost of supply exponentially, right? You take uh, Airbnb, the marginal cost of adding a room to their inventory is almost zero. Whereas if you're Hyatt, you have to build a whole hotel, right? Same with Uber, same with Waze. And same it's not a 10x difference. It's and it's, not, it's like, yeah, because now you take out the denominator. Mm. So as you take the denominator down, your, your, your market cap explodes. So people are wondering, why is Uber worth so much? Because you've taken out the marginal cost of supply. And so this is, this is now crazy. And what happens is if you're a legacy business and you've got startups coming into your industry with almost zero marginal cost of supply, you're toast. That is an existential threat because you've got this massive, you're the dinosaur, you've got this massive existing infrastructure to deal with. And all of a sudden, these guys are coming in and acquiring customers at no cost and, and supply at no cost. Mm. This is crazy. So this totally changes the game. Um, and so uh, what we think will happen in the future where we'll end up is you'll have where you still have scarcity. You'll have business models like the old style. Mm. Uh, but then we'll have a completely new breed of businesses that operate around abundance. And you'll have both juxtaposed within each other in the economy overall. So for entrepreneurs out there that have a business, so small, medium, obviously the, the bigger you are, the harder it is or should be to make the transition towards being small, agile, and powered by information and, and, and so on. What do you think are a couple of things that people could focus on? Obviously, for example, you have eight characteristics, 10 characteristics in your book. 10. So ideas and scale. Yeah. You don't need all of them, which is important. I know that for me, like, oh, do I need all these things? Like, okay. But when you made the graph and showed that Google has four and Airbnb has three or four, it's like, okay. So what do you think are one or two that are really transformational um, that you've seen being leveraged a lot in, in, in building great exponential rate. Yeah, so the biggest one, and every single EXO has one, is called the MTP or the Massive Transformative yeah. Purpose. And this is, uh, seems to have to be mandatory if you're driving your business for the future. Uh, Google organized the world's information, or yeah. Uber is everybody's private driver. It's that tagline with a social purpose built mm. in. Uh, Jim Col Collins uh, kind of created this concept with the BHAG, the big, mm. very audacious goal. And an MTP is like that plus a social purpose built mm. in, right? It's much easier then to attract a workforce and re recruit talent and retain talent because you're purpose-driven. The younger generation is much more purpose-driven. Uh, of course, once you hire them, you have to manage them, which is a whole other deal. Uh, but that's a separate podcast, probably managing mil millennials. Um, but uh, this MTP concept is a critical one. And then these is externalities like uh, staff on demand, community, and crowd. 
And then there's the internal mechanisms like the lean startup methodology, uh, real-time dashboards, decentralized org structures, et cetera. And, and if you're a startup, you should be trying to do all of them. Okay? Uh, uh, if you're a, Why? Uh, because the more the better, because every single one of them adds to your information capability, allows you more flexibility, agility. And the smaller are, the better capacity you have of adding more. Exactly. Because there's no the, you're not risk. You're starting from scratch, right? Mm -hmm. It's like saying, I'm going to build a company today and not use Amazon Web Services. Well, you're, you're putting a ball and chain on your foot, having to manage your own service. Why would you do that, right? So the first the, the sequence we'd go if you're starting a company, first pick your MTP. What is the, what is the core thing that you wake up every six, at 6 a.m. every morning to try and solve, if you could do that? Uh, number two, um, build a community around that, or find a community around that, yeah. right? whether it's driving or, or cancer or whatever is your MTP. Uh, step three, put a, a group of people together that share your passion. Step four is the, what is the idea? What is the breakthrough idea? Because we don't have a shortage of ideas. Mm. We have a shortage of uh, coalesced teams around an MTP. The idea is easy. The breakthrough idea is easy. Make sure the idea is more than 10x better than the status quo. If it's 50% better, it's not enough to break through the market noise, right? So make sure it's 10x better. And then once you've gotten to that point, now you can apply lean startup methodologies, iterate, run lots of hypotheses, et cetera, and add in the rest of the attributes. So we have a sequence that we found that works well for how you start a company like this. Uh, most notably recently is GitHub. Mm. So in our, we have a diagnostic survey in the book that allows you to score and quantify how scalable, agile, flexible is your organization. Um, GitHub, we did, when we launched, we had the list of the top 100 that we ever found, and GitHub was number one. It was the most flexible, agile company. And, and let's note that in 10 years, they've built a company that has no assets, no workforce, no intellectual property, and Microsoft just bought them for $7.5 billion, okay? And, and I'm, I'm gonna repeat this just for emphasis because again, people don't, can't register it. No assets, no workforce, no intellectual property, $7.5 billion, okay? So why the hell are you not building one of these? Why would you saddle yourself with dealing with all that stuff when you can create this much value in a new way uh, and leverage it? Yeah, and you gave examples in your book, I think in the beginning of, the, you called it the Iridium moment. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So what was that about? That was exact opposite. That's the total opposite. Yeah. That's the traditional mindset. So um, um, it was Motorola launching Iridium satellites to mm. try and deliver satellite coverage around the world. And um, uh, they didn't notice that cell phones were dropping uh, in price every um, uh, kind of 50% 50, 50 a year. Um, and the most famous was McKinsey's did a study in 1984 and told AT&T there will never be a market for more than one million mobile phones, mm. right? And AT&T actually left the business. I mean, <laughs> and then they had to buy back in. So by, in fact, by the year 2000, there were 100 million mobile phones, so they're off by like 99%. Um, and one of my favorite little stories is we were talking about this anecdote at one of the courses at Singularity. So for seven years, I ran all of our one-week programs. Um, uh, and so there's this guy in the audience, and he puts up his hand, and he goes, I co-authored that report. I was like, whoa. I thought, okay, maybe he's going to defend, rebut. He goes, no, no, you're totally right. Uh, yeah, but what we That's missed, great. what we missed was when you had the big briefcase with the handset, uh, and they cost $3,000, there's no way you're going to sell a million of those. What we missed was they were shrinking in size 50% a year, and within a few years you had a clamshell, and of course you could sell a ton of those, right? And this is really, this is the heart of it. It's really hard to see where these things go. Uh, Ray Kurzweil's genius is he can ride out those waves and look out 10, 15, 20 years and say that's where we're gonna end up, yeah. right? And, and it's very hard for most mere mortals to deal with that. David Frigstad, the CEO of Frost and Sullivan, summarized it really well. He said, when you have an exponential curve, if you miss one hop, you're off by 50%. Mm. So this is an incredibly difficult thing to spot. And almost all of the training at Singularity is how do you spot those doubling patterns, right? And it's a very visceral thing. You can't intellectually get it. You have to kind of, so what we do there is you do half a day on 3D printing, and then you go to the back and you use a 3D printer. We do half a day on robotics and you go to the back and you build a robot. Mm. So you can implant the visceral aspects of it into your, the physicality of your body and really have it bind. Uh, because otherwise it's incredibly difficult. The younger generation is kind of naturally adapt to this, right? If you're in university today, you've never known a world without Wikipedia, which is kind of a profound statement for anybody in the older world. And so there's no, I, I, you can't imagine the number of stories I have with an executive 
where he'll say something, and the millennial next to him will go, I just Googled it, you're wrong. And the guy's like, yeah, shit. Uh, wow. <laughs> Which is great at one level, but we're super annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, regarding, so all, all these changes are happening, and obviously there's people on both sides. And mm. of, of course, massive corporations and enterprises are built for that scarcity environment you were talking about, which means it's, it's hard for them to comprehend doing things completely different. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very hard. What do you think would be, so you were talking in your book about this idea, and I found it fascinating. You said there are, so information accelerates everything, right? In the characteristics that describe an ex exosystem. And you said there's companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon that basically they have so much information which builds a defensible business for them yeah. and basically builds a winner take all yes. kind of approach. So what do you think about that? Do you think we will mm. be in 10 years, 15 years, we will be run by these 25, the, like 25 companies that basically are winner, winner takes all? Or do you think we'll be a more distributed um, because they're, they're information enabled right now. Yeah. Before the so, wave. so I think uh, two, there's, it can go in a number of ways. But here's yeah. how I think it does go. Uh, and, and take in mind that I tend to be an optimist mm. around this stuff. Yeah. Right? So I tend to find the slightly rosier picture around this. So the internet came along. We thought, wow, this is great. This will decentralize information, et cetera. But then you end up with a winner take all problem. Mm. Okay. Um, and you have people building moats around their, their world and uh, Apple, Facebook, and others are trying to navigate that. Now what's happening though, we have an interesting situation where you have a kind of a big fight between the top four, right? Am Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook are all fighting it out. Everybody is a in-home product, uh, a, a home speaker yeah. uh, to trap everything that you're doing and everything that you don't want to have heard on a speaker, etc. cetera. Um, and what I find most interesting is you take Uber and Lyft Okay. Already, almost all drivers use both, right? So it's already a commodity. Yeah. So when we get to this next uh, generation of products and services, we're finding they're commoditizing much more quickly. It's harder to build that moat. Uh, and so I'm more optimistic about where we go that we'll end up a little more democratized than we thought. Mm. It's just that we have to get through this wave of navigating this pattern and the negative uses of it, like fake news and other things that are coming along, that we just didn't anticipate, mm. right? And people like to, it's easy to vilify Silicon Valley. Mm. And there are some major flaws there, but you, you know, it's hard to conceive that people could have weaponized it in the way that they did. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So there's a combination of factors. It's easy to put the blame in one place. So you're basically saying that right now, it's not that they're gonna win the whole thing, but it's just that there's not that many companies who have actually implemented all of these techniques at once. Yeah, building a solution. that's it's, that's one, and I think, but now you've got enough companies that at scale yeah. that mm -hmm. when Google uh, or when Amazon announces the Echo, uh, then like uh, very quickly Google and Apple and Facebook, and very quickly after that the Chinese companies uh, uh, have a bunch of them. And so now you have a whole basket of them, and now you've democratized it. And you've got enough competition in the marketplace that you lose the winner take all. Yeah. And so it's very hard. It's much harder today to do it. The best way to do it is uh, to create a market like that or an environment like that. Is uh, watch what's happening in Silicon Valley and as quickly as possible copy Uber or Airbnb in your local country, and get a network effect going there. And then they buy you for a chunk of money. Th that's basically what like. China did for a long, for the yes. longest of time. They basically took all the innovation and just copied it with little to no effort. Yeah, and, and that's how they build their own. That plus, and I think there's there's something else that's very powerful. There is when you have the technology going, and you can have government protection of the domestic companies. So a closed kind of. You economy. can totally, you can totally give them space to figure it out, mm. and then re they really get into a magical place, right? Mm. The other end of the scale is say uh, is Germany. Right, which is struggling with, all the countries are struggling with Google coming in and everybody using Google. But Germany has a particular problem that after World War II, they didn't want a national media platform. So you're, there's no company in Germany. In the Constitution, you're not allowed to have a national media company. But yet Google comes along. So you have the Berlin radio station, you have the Hamburg radio station, but they are not allowed to operate at a national level in the Constitution. And they're sitting and going, we're stuck at a local level. Here comes Google, and we can't, we can't compete with that. So now we see some of the tensions of the globalized world with the local environment and the idiosyncrasies of history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I was actually just researching this yesterday. There's only like four places where Google doesn't own at least 80% of the market share, like South Korea, obviously China, and a couple of other places. It was fascinating to see. But in any case, so 
in regards to building th this, this future type of organization and building the future, essentially, which is going to create, and you're talking about this in your book, for the first time, maybe 150 years ago, 1800s, we didn't have to, um, we, we could have taken ourselves out of the production uh, itself and output will still be created. And then yes. computers came along and then algorithms and now machine learning and now robotics and all these things. So it seems like the future, the way it, like, it, it goes, and you obviously know this better, it seems like we would be able to, in 50 years or in a time, time frame, we will be able to have a mass amount of output, productivity created yeah. without any, uh, any sort of... Um, Human labor. Mode. So what do you think about that? What do yeah. you think that's going to change no, no, in the way the world works? Totally correct. Uh, go, yeah. go back a thousand years ago. We were all working in the fields 18 hours a day to put three, meals, to. On, to put, just to put three meals on the table, mm -hmm. right? If you broke a leg, your family kind of was an existential threat because you couldn't go out and hunt or, or, or farm or whatever. So this is a, uh, it, we've shrunk now the amount of time needed to earn a livable wage. The Industrial Revolution uh, d abstracted it to another level. Now computers, as you said, to another level. Uh, and now, you know, in France, it's the theoretically 35 hours a week, and that's all you're allowed to work, right, to earn, mm. a, earn a livable wage. So then we, we spend a lot more time on leisure environments, et cetera, and we can see civilization going from a scarcity to an abundance environment, right? And so the question then becomes, what does life look like in that? And so we've been uh, starting to research that. We've uh, Peter talks about being bold and having entrepreneurs navigate this transition. I talk about how do you organize around this. Uh, we're starting to now think about what does the world look like when you get to the other side of that mm. curve, if you get to the other side of the curve. Right? Sure. Uh, for example, we've, we've got good evidence when you look back in history that when a society meets abundance, where the Romans conquering most of Europe and um, half the world, or the Mughals taking over India, um, it's pretty clear to see historically what happened. And, and be able to, so what happens is, uh, you end up uh, with society doing um, uh, food, art, music, and sex. Mm. Not in that order. Uh, uh, sure. So, so you end up with kind of a, a lot of artistic expression. People kind of float around doing whatever they want. And it's a, it's a lovely society until then it collapses because they've, they've, they're not navigating the scarcity well enough. Mm. But now, so in terms of our kind of context, I think where we get to is we, we're delivering more and more productivity with technology. It's very clear we'll end up with a universal basic income type of structure uh, where your basic needs are met and then you do whatever you want. Yeah. Right? And when we've studied this, we've seen 14 experiments around the world on this that have been profoundly successful. Um, with uh, universal basic income? With UBI, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, but the transition from a workforce, labor, union, taxation uh, um, economy to that is such a huge leap. We have no confidence in our political structures from getting us from A to B. Right? Yeah. Here in Canada, they did this in Manitoba a couple of decades ago, and they said, just give everybody uh, money. It was so successful, but they didn't instrument it. They didn't measure it. It was profoundly successful, and the next government came in and said, that can't be a good idea, and they shut it down. And then all the problems started again. 30 years ago. Yeah, they've been running this for a while. Wow. So we have, we, we, when we've been able to analyze it in detail and see the longitudinal studies, Profoundly interesting things happen because you take everybody out of the bottom layer of Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. Right? And now they can focus on what gives them Higher aspiration, etc. They don't have to worry about this. The huge difference between Canada and the U.S. is in the U.S., if you have a medical issue, your family has to declare bankruptcy. Medical bankruptcy so is the leading cause of bankruptcy, you think. And so you never, you're always on an edge. You're always on the edge. And then you give them guns. I mean, this is not a great outcome. So you, you cross the border into Canada and everybody's like way more set of stable, peaceful, calm, people are not freaked out, whatever. And you wonder, what's the difference? It's not that hard to figure out. So you, you, you said something, and I think in a, in a talk you gave about, um, clearly me if I'm wrong, masculine energy and feminine energy dealing with scarcity and abundance. Yeah. And you said whenever uh, like men deal with scarcity, they do, deal well with it, but then when they get into abundance, they don't know how to handle it. And yes. that's when we need, yes. and that's what the transition we're making right now with, with gender equality, like a lot of things that are happening in terms of it, gender. And, and no, you've hit it exactly yeah. on the head. The, the talk was titled Occupy Male Street. Yes. Uh, and it was about five, six years ago. Yeah. Um, and the, the, it talks about the fact that we're moving from a, a top-down hierarchical command and control scarcity mindset to a much more decentralized, participatory, nurturing kind of environment. So we run the world right now, we run it on a very top-down structure, right? Judeo-Christian religions and uh, the corporations, 
the military industrial complex, <laughs> usually a man at the top. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and then we're moving to a, a more of a female archetype. And mm. it's important to m note that I mean the archetype, not the gender. Yes. Right? But now we have Burning Man, the maker movement, the open source movement, the gifting economy, the DIY movement. And you operate very differently in that world. And uh, one of the insights I got from one of the uh, 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 a lady called Nicole Dreisky, um, who has done something incredible around education. Um, but she m noted that when, when the male archetype is under stress, it goes to the fight or flight response. And we thought all human beings did. And then if, about a decade ago, they, ran those, they looked at those studies and said, you know, all the people in those studies were men. So we know that men go fight or flight, but do women do the same thing? So they put women under stress. And it turns out women don't go to fight or flight at all. Interesting. Women go to what's called tandem befriend. They, they huddle up and they nurture each other, Nourishing it which is what's happening on, say, the Occupy Wall Street movement or, or, or so on. And what we're seeing in the world today is the female archetype is under extreme stress. Right? And the observation that you pointed out, which is a really subtle one but very important, is when the male archetype reaches abundance, they relate to it as power and they try to hoard it. Uh, Wall Street money, Middle East oil, Because they're used with scarcity. They're, they're used to fighting for scarcity mm. and they want to own as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, when the female archetype meets abundance, they share it around. Right? So the first thing happens when you bring a big uh, uh, thing, uh, uh, an elephant home from the village and you've hunted it, is you, all the women share it around amongst all the families. Mm. Right? And that's, that's the natural female archetype. And the internet is like that. You naturally share things. Right? And that's the female archetype. And as we move to abundance, we need a female archetype running the world, not the male archetype. Yeah. And so this is the tension and that we're clarify, seeing right not now. Just not men and women. It's an archetype. It's which an is archetype. A very, yeah. yeah. So I, I, th that's, I think that's a very interesting point of view because you'd see all these changes that are happening with, with, uh, with uh, like men and women, like more women in positions of management and so on. And there's, there's a lot of movements that are going on which I think are very beneficial to the future. And the very simple women. observation of what's happening yeah. is that as we enter a world of extreme transition and extreme uncertainty driven by technology, so many things changing around us, the, the human need and human nature is to want an authoritarian, somebody who sounds like they know what they're talking about. So you right? can... And so you end up with Brexit where they go, yes, we, it should be the Britain leaves. We're totally confident in what happens. Or Trump or, or Bolsonaro or Mexico, what's happening there. And you end up with authoritarian figures and you end up in a hell of a mess, and which is where we're kind of heading. So the so, two futures that we are heading towards right now is we either, have, we either can guide civilization to a Star Trek world or a Mad Max world. Mm. Right? It's pretty clear we're heading down a Mad Max world right now. We have to figure out how to tilt that future and tilt the direction of this super tanker called civilization a little bit over so we get into a more stable environment. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just laughing because when you were speaking, I remember you were, you were saying in a video that because of all these exponential technologies, because of the fact that we're going to live longer and, and we're going to have much more the period of life that we're going to be healthy is going to be longer. There's a lot of companies that don't have any products anymore, like religion and stuff like that, because if you live for 200 years, it's going to be tough to sell you on that thing. So, um, the, the joke is that most religions are selling heaven as, an Af as a business model. Which was 30 years. Uh, you were dying is, at 30 yeah. years, so it made sense. If you died at 25 or 30, then you could sell that as a business model. But now if you're lasting 100, 150 years, it's harder to sell heaven. Yeah. So in regards to, uh, and we're getting close to, uh, to the end here, in regards to... Um, so what the future will look like. What's the breed of entrepreneur that we need? I, I, and I'm gonna, if you wanna share this story, I think that was a pretty funny story about you talking about, uh, you talking to Elon Musk about Hi Hyperloop and how he yeah. like, oh yeah, like the, the way he, he looked at the problems and everything was fascinating. So what do you think is the breed of entrepreneurs that's needed in, in this kind of new age? And also if you can share that story. That yeah, sure. Really so Elon is designing the Hyperloop, as yeah. you know. Or, and open sourced it because yeah. he's got four other companies. By yeah, the way, his methodology is very, very simple, right? He looks at a technology that's accelerating exponentially and he plots 10 years out. Where will that technology be in 10 years? And then he aims to build a company to intercept that curve in 10 years. Okay? Because it takes 10 years to because build a Because it kind of mm. takes 10 years to build a global kind of solid company. And then you meet the curve and boom, off you go. And whether it's Tesla or SpaceX or Solar City or whatever, that's what he's doing, or the new brain company, et cetera. Right? That's, it's very simple methodology, uh, riding out those 10 year, 10 year patterns. If you can see and project out where they go and then live off it. Uh, Ray Kurzweil has been doing this for, for decades. Um, and the, the, uh, he designed this Hyperloop thing. The idea is to go from LA to San Francisco in 20 minutes at about 4,000 miles an hour. Um, and uh, I was on the, 
The Economist magazine has an annual Innovators Award, and I was on one of the judges, and so I was chatting with Elon about this uh, at this uh, at this award ceremony. And and I said, Elon, I have a degree in theoretical physics. If you accelerate a human being in 20 minutes from zero to 4,000 miles an hour, and then decelerate them back to zero, you're probably going to kill them. Uh, and his answer was, yes, it's an issue, right? And <laughs> this is the this is the up. This is the pattern, this is the mentality, I think, that is so important and so needed in this next generation, yeah. where they just go, yeah, we'll figure it out, you know? And then what's important is I would have stopped. I would have gone, that's the not expert. possible, and let's not bother. I would have been the resident expert going, you can't do that. Mm. Let's figure out a different way. That whole uh, Hyperloop thing would never work, et cetera. And, and yeah, I would have stopped. And so this is the tension that we see in the world now of, of you've got an old way of thinking, and a completely new way of thinking that are fundamentally not compatible, hmm. right? Vitalik Buterin, 18 years old, from Toronto, invents Ethereum, Brilliant. right? Based on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. By the way, there's some bylaw written somewhere that you have to be below 25 years old to program the blockchain. I don't know whether that's written, but it seems to be well, like universally followed because you can't get your heads around it, mm. right? And you would look at bankers versus Bitcoin as a classic example of the immune system. It's yeah. so alien to them. They can't conceive of this thing because all money used to measure scarcity mm. and now we have a monetary system of abundance. So I, I spend now all of my time on this immune system problem uh, and we've cracked it. We've, we've, we've been working for three, four years on solving it in organizations and companies. We run a 10 week process and we're able to move leadership, culture, management thinking three years ahead in that 10 week period. So the next book that's coming out open source is that. But now the work that I'm doing and my more That's interested called Exponential in, Transformations by that, the way. Yeah, yeah, and it's basically a manual on how to run this 10 week process. We, we piloted it with Procter & Gamble three years ago. And we've now run it like a dozen times with global blue chip companies. And so we're super excited about that. Mm. Because pretty much every one of the global 5,000 has to go through this process. Yeah. Right, with or without us. So let's just open source it and see where it goes. But the really interesting uh, work we're doing now is how can we apply that to the public sector? Mm. Because in the public sector, the existing policy is the immune system, right? You try and update transportation and you get taxis versus Uber, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Uber strategy of deliberately breaking the law, uh, leapfrogging to public acceptance, and then waiting for policy to catch up is very successful for them, but it's a very uncomfortable process, right? So how can we navigate that? And so once we crack this at the private sector level, we said, okay, could we apply this to public sector? And so we formed a nonprofit. Um, and we ran it a few times in Medellin in Colombia. Uh, and it takes 16 weeks because it's public sector. But we find we can take a problem like transportation or healthcare or education. And we aim to solve that problem for one-tenth of what it's currently costing. So 10x. 10x better, mm. right? Which makes it compelling from an economic perspective. And everybody gets so excited. So you're listening now. And, uh, yeah. And, and for example, in Miami, they, so in most big cities actually, they spend $4,000 per transit passenger per year for public transportation. 4,000. 4,000. For that, you could give everybody a car and just dismantle the entire public transportation. Because if you're running in a medium-sized city, most of the bus routes run empty 90% of the time, so it's, which costs a ton of money. So asset completely. Totally. In fact, a, a, a few cities are now saying, the hell with all of our public transportation. We'll just use the taxes to pay for Uber mm. and get rid of it. And it's super successful. And mm. it works really well. Right? So. So, so we're, we're, the question is, can you run in this in the public sector? So we ran it a few times in Medellin to test it out. We ran it last year with the mayor of Miami on the future of public transportation. And we just finished that process with mm. the, in Colombia with the president's office and the Supreme Court to redo the justice system mm. in Colombia. Mm. Uh, so fascinating to see how can we can navigate this. Because you take a justice system, there's so much information like public court dates and court so briefs and filings that could be, could be on a blockchain. And then you, you make it uncorruptible in a sense and make it much more steady and, and, and faster. It's, it seems like, it feels to me that blockchain was probably created, it feels more uh, uh, targetable towards the public sector since like the way it's, the, the way it's security works and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, my, my question is, and let's, let's go towards here, like, I think this is interesting. What do you think in, in, your, in your, the way you see uh, the next couple of years and you work with the public sector going from the private sector and working with them obviously much faster, faster feedback because you can learn, you can develop a better process. What do you think will be the impact towards the world if you get countries to help on board and implement this methodology? And every, because it seems that that's the major roadblock yeah. to, to massive uh, it, it improvement. It is. And, and what, we, what we're thinking about is, okay, 
So we think there's a few big macro dynamics happening. Yeah. Okay. One is that well, we have run the world for the last two, three hundred years on the concept of the nation state. Yeah. That does not work in the future. Mm. Um, uh, you take big cities like Tokyo, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, uh, Shanghai. They're bigger and more complex than almost any country was 100 years ago, mm. right? So, so uh, we're, we think what we'll end up with is city-states. City In states. fact, if you think about Brexit or you think about Trump, yeah. this is not a left versus right thing. This is urban versus rural, right? London has too much power, and the rest of the country says, screw that, we're taking it back. Right? And we're going to pull out of Europe and cause a lot of mess because we're not getting what we want out of it. So this is the, this is the tension that we're seeing. And so what we think we'll end up doing, and you know, in the same way that it, we're the, the, uh, in society we're kind of hollowing out the middle class, mm. and you get very rich or very poor, and in the business world you have very big search engines and very small applications, but nobody in the middle. There's no medium-sized search engines mm. or medium-sized auctions. Because you can't. You can't. It's too hard. You're either really big or really small. Okay? And, and if you're really big, you end up as a platform, uh, and then you end up as an ecosystem. That's where the business world is heading. So we're kind of trying to build an ecosystem around our world and go straight for that kind of paradigm today. But in, if you think about that from a geopolitical perspective, you have the UN, you have nation states, then you have provinces or states, and then you have cities. Well, you don't need any of that in a, in a world of abundance, right? Uh, just as a quick point, very simple point, yeah. we invented representative democracies to run the world when information was scarce, right? If you were in Washington, D.C., you had no idea what was happening in California because the speed of a horse was as fast was as no you way could to find know. out. Yeah. So and so you, you, that. you give people time to cross the country. Congress might occasionally to give people time to cross the country and say, here's what my people in Idaho are thinking. And mm -hmm. you go, okay, that's what they're thinking, that's what they're thinking, let's pass national laws to deal with that. But, but now we have an abundance of information. It gets misused, misinterpreted, faked, et cetera, and every major democracy is broken. Mm. Right? India, um, my family is very involved in the independence movement broken, Brazil broken, the US uh, breaking right now, UK broke two years ago. And it is not a sustainable form of government in the future that is coming towards us with it, like a trillion censors, et cetera. A, it's moving too quickly, and democratic systems tend to make, uh, they tend to make the right decisions, but they take, it, do, they do it slowly, women's yeah. rights, et cetera. Um, but we're in a world where we need to make decisions much more, fa much more quickly, and we need to make decisions much more at a local level. Right? And so we think what we'll end up with is city-states uh, at, a, at, a, at a governance model with a kind of a light federation of city-states to replace something like the UN. Right? Mm. The UN fundamentally doesn't work today because it's nation-state driven. Mm. Uh, and and it's too when one country can just veto what the hell's going on, it, it's, it's, it becomes irrelevant. And so we, it, we've done a great first crack at trying to create a global world order, but basing it on the concept of the nation-state is flawed. Uh, and you look at the problems in, in the U.S., yeah. right? This cannot sustain. In fact, Paul Saffo, one of the most famous futurists and forecasters in the world, right. made this point. He said, I do not expect the U.S. to exist as a country in 25 years the way it's going. And you can see this happening. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's such a powerful thing that you're focused on that with your work because it seems that on, on a scale of, like, on the speed scale, that's the slowest entity organism that will move and is the biggest mismatch in terms of their impact. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating that you're going to work towards more and more uh, in, that, in that field and see how, how it can change. So, the uh, problem is that nation states have armies. And so that's going to be a... So they have some leverage. They have, they have some leverage. So yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. they will not go quietly into the night. Yeah. So um, the last couple of things. Um, hmm. You did say, though, like, for the first time in history, the power to shape society lies in the hands of individuals, not governments. By that, you meant that all these things, all these, um, uh, these roadblocks, these gatekeepers as technologies, like cloud computing and stuff like that, were not there, so you kind of needed, like, $5 million to start a company. That's what you meant there, right? Yeah. Got it. Well, or you needed a huge amount of government support to do it, right? Yeah. So mm. uh, the Internet and, and GPS and so on were kind of originally military inventions. Yeah. Uh, and in the past, all disruptive breakthroughs happened in a in a government lab or a large private corporate lab. Yeah. And then you commercialized it and brought it to market, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Uh, and the US and other countries have done a good job of saying we're going to invent things at a government level uh, and then release them out into the world for commercialization like GPS or the internet and others. Mm. Uh, but what's happening now is the breakthrough doesn't happen from ba deep basic research. It happens where you intersect mm. these different areas, right? Cryptocurrency is an and intersection of cryptography and computation, uh, and, and we have uh, neuroscience breakthroughs where we're just intersecting different fields together. 
And so that means anybody can go take something and go, okay, biotech meets AI, what do I do, right? Uh, or uh, autonomous cars meets uh, drones meets um, uh, AI-based thinking or based location-based sensors, and what can I do with that? And so uh, more and more things are happening at the intersections of these areas, and that allows anybody to come in and break the paradigm, the old paradigm, in a totally new way. And so we're, we're seeing an explosion of innovation. The way I frame it is, uh, in the 15th century, we had the Gutenberg moment. Mm. And the printing press just changed the world completely. Big deal. And I argue today we have about 20 of those hitting us at the same time. And all of them exponentially going together. And Every single one, because just solar changes seen. the world, autonomous cars change the world, drones mm. change the world, CRISPR and biotech change the world. And we've got 20 of those hitting us at the same time. This is the stress in the world. Yeah. Is yeah. how the hell are we going to navigate this? Because our amygdala freaks out when we see something new. We relate to it as danger. Right? So when you first see an autonomous car, the initial amygdala response is, oh my god, look at that car, it might kill somebody, let's ban the car. Mm. Right? We forget that we're killing 1.2 million people a year with car accidents around the world today, uh, which is just a staggering number. Right? My favorite statistic, by the way, about cars in the US, 50% of all legal court cases in the US, car accidents. Really? 50%, so you have autonomous cars, you can take out a bunch of lawyers at the same time. Yeah. That's gotta be great. Yeah. So. I, I'm going to summarize a couple of points. Let me know if I got it right so that we can, we can summarize it for people. So there's all these wide and infrastructure type technologies that are evolving at the same time and multiplying with each other, creating an exponential that we, we cannot even comprehend the scale of it. Right. And all of these things um, will create a future in which there's going to be so much output, so much abundance being created. So it seems like the best thing you can do as an organization is do what Elon does and start from first principles, start from scratch, yeah. don't base yourself with any type of historical old mindset thinking and deal with that and attack the world like that. Yes. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you think? hundred percent agree. Yeah. And, and this is why a younger, the younger generation has so much opportunity because they Talk naturally- Talk to me about your son. So how do you, uh, sorry for yeah. this topic, but what do you think, how do you train him? Because you're obviously the father of this, right? Yeah. The father of the, 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 the movement and the yeah. father of your son, obviously. Um, how do you train him to be, like, obviously you're in the educational business, which is yep. the core infrastructure. So how do you see his so, education evolving and growing? And so two things, two yeah. or three things. Yeah. First, the current model of education doesn't work. Sure. And the reason is that we've trained all our educational systems are trained to uh, uh, give kids skills through their early 20s to be ready for the existing job market, right? Except we don't know what a job looks like in five years. What the hell are we teaching? So a yeah. minor problem there. Um, but you take something like GitHub, where you can rank each other's uh, software code and give you, you can give me a Yelp review on my code and so on. Um, today in Silicon Valley, your salary as a software developer has zero correlation anymore to which university you went to, which degree you got, or what grades you got. It's 100% what's your GitHub rating. So the value of a computer science degree just went to zero. Right? Because why would you get, why don't you spend hundreds of thousand dollars on a, on a computer science degree when my salary depends on take this. Take it out by GitHub. Not that, yeah. Okay, so that's one. Uh, but more importantly, at a more structural level, and one thing we noticed at Singularity was that if you are doing a master's degree in any of these areas that we cover, like biotech or advanced robotics or neuroscience, literally by the time you finish your master's in neuroscience, you're out of date. Mm. Because our ability to teach the subject can't keep pace with the changes in the area. That's a structural issue. We need a totally different paradigm. And the way we deal with it, dealt with the Singularity was saying, we're gonna spend 80% of our curriculum teaching the future and what so you that think will come. So you're practiced in this conversation rather than what happened in the past or how did this model happen, how did this equation develop, right? And if you're a leader, you need to be somewhat practiced in what's mm. coming in, in the future. So education fundamentally breaks in this model. The uh, way we guide our son is, and what we recommend for, and what we're seeing more and more, is you don't give the kid a, a skill set. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't say, okay, go be an accountant or go be a lawyer or you seem a little bit artistic, go do whatever. You, you help them find their native passion for what problem they want to solve, right? Let them, let them uh, uh, and there's now new schooling Experiment movements and, where mm -hmm. people say, okay, you're, the curriculum of your, class, your kid will be chosen by what does he want to do when he grows up? So the kid goes, I want to be a fireman. Great, that means you need to know chemistry and physics and safety equipment and teamwork, and they give them the skills for that level. Mm. And so you give them skills for a social cohesion first and then let them build hard skills later because you, don't, you can't teach them hard skills now 
and then find out 10 years later that mm. those hard skills don't matter anymore. Mm. Right? So we have them in a pretty interesting school. Um, the reason we're here in Canada is we put him temporarily in the school, and after an hour, he goes, I'm never leaving. We're like, wait, no, 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 we just came up here temporarily. And he's, after a week, we're like, what do you think? He goes, so he never liked leaving. the school so much. He, he's never leaving that school. After That's a week, a we said, problem. how do you like the school? He go, never leaving. And, and the, wow. so one day he comes home from school. What did you learn at school today? And he goes, he was five. He goes, I learned how to control my impulsivity. And we're like, that's fantastic. Just go right, <laughs> you just go right back to school. And so I'm, the worst thing I could do, the worst thing we could do as parents is to, to say to kids, do more mathematics or more reading because mm. that's how we grew up, right? Their world is totally different. They need to operate and navigate their world in the way that works best for their upbringing, not for what we went through. And this is the enormous tension that we have around the world. We see this is the tension in society is that we, our natural habit is to take what was done before and whack it in, and it, and it doesn't apply. Because it feels safe, it's risk yeah. averse, it's all the things that we've been emotionally and, and cognitively it, trained to do. Exactly. Right. So in regards to technology with Singular University, how, what role do you guys play in this entire movement? And what do you think would be other solutions? in regards to like early education and all these other things. So and, um, we, we've kind of, we focused yeah. on higher education yeah. for the specific reason that this next 20, 30 years of, uh, of, gonna of is, is, going to, is going to be huge. We need better leadership to run mm. the world, right? Okay. So I have kind of four observations about the world. One is that we have these 20 Gutenberg moments. Number two, this is breaking every institution, okay? Uh, number three is we see things much more implemented at a city level rather than nation level. And number four is, as we talked about, is our current leaders cannot make this transition. All of our existing leadership is trained to operate in a predictable, stable, linear, uh, scarcity, um, incremental world. Mm. And the train is pulling into Black Swan Central. Mm. Right? So we need totally new leadership. Okay? If we need new leadership, and it's, it's a 20, 30 year period, then let's get the 25, 30 year olds that are going to be running the world in the next five to 10 years and give them this training as to what's coming with society. And when they go back to their home countries, they hopefully will make better decisions than the current crop of leaders today. Okay? And so that was the first thing. Get the graduate students that will be running the world. So when we have 5,000 applicants every year for 80 slots, we're really trying to pick for who do we think is running those countries. So and they those have regions. the most And, and then send them back. Okay? And that's the phase one. Phase two, which is what I'm working on now, is how do you now transition our legacy institutional structures, first organizations, but, but then institutions like journalism, education, et cetera. So the, let's take journalism. What I'd like to do next and what we're working on now is let's get all of the uh, top thinkers in that space together and figure out what should it look like in 20 years because we don't have a good view of that in any mm. of these domains. And then we have some place to aim for. Mm. And then we can bring technology and other things to bear. So you can on orient that. the whole yeah. industry towards Right now, it. we kind of stumble along and go, oh, blockchain, oh, social media, and we're retroactively fighting things, mm. right? Whereas we should kind of get ahead of it and say, okay, we know what's coming in technology. What should education look like in 20 years? What should journalism look like in 20 years? What should um, uh, voting systems and what should democracy look like? Rather than constantly fighting from a rear guard mm. perspective and fighting the legacy and fighting the backwards, we should be fighting forwards. And so what I want to do now is create a cohort and an ecosystem over the top couple of thousand kind of, you know, TED fellows and Davos Young Global Leaders and Singularity alumni and give them tools where they can envision for the area they're most interested in, figure out what that looks like, and then that will create the kind of intellectual framework for what the world needs to look like next. That's beautiful. I, it's, I think it's, it's such an amazing, um, because you're making an impact at such a, 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 such a distributed level that is gonna have a network effect upon everything else when you're teaching those leaders and you're, when you're having them be equipped to deal with the world. Hope, uh, if we succeed. Yeah. Also yeah. means I'm bald from the stress of it all. But they're yeah, 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 yeah. But they're doing fine. This is actually my last question, and we'll end with sure. this, and then we'll do a little giveaway for, for folks. So it, it's I, I I so the first time I, I watched your video, I got so attracted by like the the level of you could have seen like if if I muted mute, mute you out like no audio, I just looked at you. It's like there's a level of connection to source or whatever you may call it, level of energy that's coming out that might, it, it cannot be willpower. It cannot be 
uh, I slept 12 hours last night, so I'm, I'm rested, so therefore I'll deliver this talk. You just talk to us like how you went, had a red eye today to here, and then it, like, uh, you're, like there's all these things happening. So it's something beyond your physical ability. Yeah. So what's your MTP? And then how, how does that impact your whole life? Because I think that we as entrepreneurs and as move shakers and executives and all these people should really take a step back and look at that because that seems like the fuel yeah. And the kerosene that will, that will be able to fuel everything so, else. So my personal MTP or my massively transformative purpose is, is to transform civilization. That's, um, a, uh, uh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, and I feel like, like I said before, you know, my, my grandmothers both knew Gandhi and Nehru very well in India. Yeah. And I grew up in this kind of family of foreign service, etc. I think my family looked at me early and said, ah, he'll never amount to anything, and kind mm. of ignored me, um, maybe for the best. Uh, and then... Uh, when I did this TED talk a couple of years ago called How Do You Fix Civilization focused on this immune system, a kind of light bulb went off. And mm. I noticed that every single piece of my career, by accidents or not, or whatever causality, has been guiding me to this point. And then when I gave this talk, I kind of clicked and said, this is what I have to be doing. Mm. And I've got, been graced with uh, an abundance of uh, credibility and access now and, and a community that is really interested in solving this. And when I look at what's coming in the world, uh, and I look at uh, all of our kids, it, we can't not do what needs to be done. We can't sit by and kind of sit there and go, oh, well, we've totally screwed it up for this next generation. There you go. Hang because, on. you know, we haven't even touched on climate change, but this is like the massive structural issue facing the world today. We have to essentially run every power plant and mine and uh, energy um, um, causing, uh, carbon causing problem backwards for 100 years. Yeah, that's the task of this next twenty years. So it's a huge challenge. I, I so we're gonna end, end with that. But I want to deeply thank you. I know you've impacted me, and you've impacted so many people. Uh, and it's I think it's such a you, you probably don't even like you don't even emotionally comprehend it. Doesn't, like doesn't register. Four hundred thousand people <laughs> impacted by me. Like okay, like how should I feel about that? But um, thank you so much for the, the dedication you put into it. And I think it's gonna is is gonna be a really meaningful meaningful thing. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody that's, uh, that's watching. We're going to do one thing, and then we're going to end. I want to give away three signed copies of your book uh, okay. for people that are going to send you a tweet with one takeaway, and then we're going to choose three people. Okay. And we're going to send them a signed book. Um, and what else? What else? Well, I think that's it. I think that's it. So three signed copies of this book and Exponential Transformation is also out. That's a playbook, so that's it, the implementation It's coming guide. shortly. In, in fact, it was supposed to come out. Is it uh, out now? It was supposed to come out, but the, the, we did a, a, the launch webinar a couple of weeks ago, and people from 53 countries were in the webinar, registered for it, and then it basically <laughs> broke the publisher. So the publisher the, the was publisher, like, stop it. The publisher systems yeah. can't cope. They, they just ha have no ability Are to Are they an exponential organization? They, no, <laughs> because it's a physical book. And you, yeah, 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 So yeah. we're like, we just broke the scarcity world. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. so it's a good problem to have, but it's going to be delayed by a few weeks while we figure out how to get uh, thousands of copies out when they thought it would be, the demand would be much less. Yeah. But good problem to have. Yeah, so exponential organization, exponential transformations, which is the implementation of Playbook Guide, Singular University, a lot of things for people to check you out and, and to see how they can get involved and maybe get involved in some of your executive programs and all these things that you guys are doing and events. I know you guys just had an event a month ago. So in any case, it's going to wrap up. Thank you again and wish you all the best. All the best. Thank you.